Euh, je suis Fabrizio Gallanti, le directeur d'Aquarelle Centre d'Architecture. Je suis très content de vous, de vous voir ici pour ces activités. Donc, euh, de manière d'accompagner les propos et les thématiques qui sont avancées dans l'exposition, qui nous accompagnait depuis juin et qui malheureusement sera de monter à partir de demain. Nous avons envisagé autant, euh, durant le mois de juin et juillet, ainsi que durant le mois de septembre, de réaliser une série d'activités publiques, de rencontres, de colloques, d'échanges, de manière de pouvoir amplifier euh, ces thèmes, de pouvoir les, les explorer avec un peu plus de finesse. Donc, nous sommes assez conscients qu'une exposition permet une perception assez courte de contenu, vice-versa, le fait d'avoir pouvoir euh, recevoir ici à Bordeaux plusieurs des acteurs des projets que vous avez dans cette exposition nous a permis de mieux comprendre les enjeux euh, les stratégies, les tactiques avec lesquelles on construit du, du commun avec les citoyens. Et donc, euh, à travers euh, cinq jours très intenses, euh, nous avons terminé hier soir à 4 heures du matin une fête ici euh, dans le centre. Euh, nous avons pu effectivement euh, enrichir ces discussions et ces, dé et ces débats. Euh, Aujourd'hui, nous avons deux modules qui nous permettent donc de, de, de clore cette séquence qui pour nous est très, extrêmement enrichissante. D'ailleurs, tout a été enregistré, filmé, sera bientôt remis en ligne sur le site d'Internet d'Arcorel, avec deux éléments qui pour nous sont très importants. Le premier, c'est d'inviter entre les participants à ces conversations les deux commissaires de l'exposition, David Brown, qui a été commissaire de l'exposition de la Biennale de Chicago 2021, The Available City, qui est un des éléments porteurs de ce projet, et plus tard, Christophe Cutin, qui était commissaire de commun, ainsi que le commissaire du pavillon français à Venise en 2021. Donc, avec eux aussi, on va un peu revisiter, retraverser quelles ont été les, les intentions de ce projet. Et donc, deux modules. Le premier avec David, avec Francisco Quignones, architecte qui vient de, du Mexique, du département du district. Isabelle Strauss, qui est membre du collectif Rift Studio de New York. On va commencer, et c'est Christophe Katsaros qui va animer cette conversation, sur l'idée de quel est un patrimoine en commun, l'idée est quand même assez euh, difficile à, à saisir. On parle de moins en moins de patrimoine, tout simplement comme, comme, comme des murs, des briques et des pierres, et plutôt comme une chose parfois immatérielle, qui est faite de mémoire, qui est faite d'histoire, qui est faite de personnes. Et pour continuer sur cette, sur cette question, un peu différemment aussi, vu que nous sommes dans une des journées du patrimoine, nous allons accueillir plus tard Jean-Philippe Passal, euh, Renaud Epstein et Christophe Hutin pour discuter de pourquoi démolir n'est pas une bonne stratégie. Pourquoi démolir n'est pas la bonne chose à faire si on veut continuer à construire du commun Merci beaucoup. Je laisse la parole à Christophe Katsaros qui sera l'animateur de cette conversation. Pour ceux qui... Je, vois, je commence à voir des visages qui, qui sont en train de, de me devenir familiers, de personnes qui nous ont accompagnés pendant ces cinq jours. Vous savez très bien que l'idée, c'est que ces conversations soient ouvertes. Donc, n'hésitez pas à interroger nos, nos participants, à, à rentrer aussi, vous, dans le vif du débat. L'idée de cet espace, comme vous voyez, assez, assez horizontal est justement celui de pouvoir augmenter ces discussions. Si je comprends bien, la ça sera en anglais, euh, la conversation. Donc, il devrait y avoir des casques, j'espère. On a des casques pour la traduction simultanée. Donc, si vous souhaitez écouter la traduction simultanée, sur la partie arrière de, de cet espace, vous pouvez obtenir des casques pour la traduction. Donc, ce qu'on peut apercevoir aujourd'hui à la fin de cette session de discussion, c'est la richesse du sujet. Et Aujourd'hui, on va essayer d'ajouter, on peut dire, une, un chapitre qui est celui du patrimoine. Et dans le patrimoine, comme l'a très bien dit Fabrizio, on n'entend pas juste la valeur, on peut dire, le, le bien matériel qui doit être préservé pour des raisons historiques ou pour des raisons de mémoire, mais on entend bien évidemment la valeur d'usage que peut avoir un bâtiment qui a été préservé, et essayer de comprendre comment l'usage, lui aussi, peut devenir, avoir une valeur patrimoniale. C'est-à-dire, on peut préserver, on peut dire, la mémoire de l'usage d'un lieu. Et moi, j'aime bien citer dans ce cas-là un, un, un épisode qui est un épisode que vous connaissez peut-être, autour euh, de la condition publique à Roubaix, qui était un entrepôt, comme ici, euh, sur le qui a été euh, rénové euh, au début euh, et reconverti au début des années 2000 par Patrick Bouchin. Et un des, des, une des anecdotes autour de ce projet, c'est que la poussière qui était entreposée sur le toit de cet entrepôt contenait des graines qui étaient des graines qui venaient, qui venaient pas de la région, qui venaient même pas de ce qu'on y entreposait, mais qui venaient du thé que consommaient des ouvriers qui travaillaient dans cet entrepôt. Des, des ouvriers polonais. Donc on a trouvé sur le toit, un siècle après, des plantes 
qui était, qui n'avait d'autre origine, et ça c'est un botanologue qui l'a démontré, qui n'avait d'autre origine que l'origine des ouvriers qui travaillaient dans l'entrepôt. Donc là, on a vraiment l'exemple de quelque chose d'immatériel qui devient, on peut dire, qui, qui acquiert une dimension patrimoniale. Bien évidemment, l'idée, c'est pas de patrimonialiser cette, cette valeur immatérielle, mais de la reconnaître et de laisser d'autres euh, usages émerger. Alors aujourd'hui, pour poursuivre dans cette réflexion et dans cette euh, compréhension du sujet, nous avons invité euh, deux architectes, Isabelle Strauss et Francisco Quinones, ainsi que euh, David Brown, qui est le commissaire de la, la Biennale de Chicago, qui va un peu faire un peu la synthèse aussi et qui va surtout nous raconter comment hein, il, a, il, a, il a déniché une grande partie des sujets qu'il a développés pour cette biennale. Mais voilà, essayons déjà de voir un tout petit peu comment ça fonctionne dans le cas du Mexique. Et Francisco Quinone est ce qui va parler en anglais. Donc je, une dernière fois, je rappelle, pour ceux qui ont besoin d'un casque, nous en avons. Euh, il va nous raconter un peu sa pratique et son rapport au patrimoine. Please, Francisco. Hi. Christophe, thank you for the introduction. I will try to, I'm holding a lot of things. Um, first, I'd like to thank Arkan Rev for the invitation to participate in this event. Special thanks to Fabrizio, Mark, and Eric for all the coordination to make it possible. Uh, we've been asked to talk about the subject of heritage in common. So today I'll speak around those themes, specifically relating to public space, infrastructure, and city identity while also using this opportunity to put our, our installation uh, in the exhibit in context, which you can see on the right. Uh, but um, yes, the talk today focuses on an ongoing research project and a related installation that was originally designed by my practice, Departamento del Distrito, for the 2021 Chicago Architecture Biennial, and that is now being shown here as part of Comun. Uh, first, let me give you some background information, just quickly. I'm one half of the practice Departamento del Distrito, which was co-founded with Nathan Friedman in 2017. The practice is based in Mexico City, and much of the work that we're currently engaged in uh, is highly site-specific. The city proper has a population of approximately 9 million people, with a, largest uh, with a larger metropolitan area estimated to contain 21.5 million which makes it the largest metropolitan area of the Western Hemisphere. The portion of Mexico City pictured here on the screen, uh, even though it looks immense, is actually a very narrow and specific slice. For those of you who might know it or be familiar with it, uh, here you can see uh, Avenida Insurgentes running north to south, Parque España and Parque Mexico parks in Condesa, Avenida Reforma running uh, west to east, the historic center and our office in the far right of the image. Our practice, Departamento del Distrito, is conceptualized as a department or one part of a greater whole. The term recognizes architects and architecture as part of a larger system of the built environment, which within our specific context is the federal district of Mexico City. However, the name is also aspirational. It is a call to reimagine what our institutions are and can be. As you know, last year's Chicago Architecture Biennial, curated by David Brown, looked at how our cities are designed and developed, while also pushing for alternative models through community engagement and small-scale interventions that would collectively add up to something much larger. Our contribution to CAP 2021, titled Miracles Now, looks at the current status of architectural and urban projects constructed during the so-called Milagro Mexicano, or Mexican Miracle, in Mexico City a sustained economic growth period that spanned the 1940s to the 1970s. Today, many of these projects, and there are hundreds of them that we've cataloged, stand at a turning point. Architecture from the 20th century in Mexico is largely unprotected by federal preservation law, and many of them will either be demolished or renovated in the coming decade, based on the whims of private owners and developers. 
In response to this, our project seeks to generate a public conversation around the recovery and reinvention of these projects and to ask, what value do they hold for our current society? One clear example that serves as introduction is Super Servicio Lomas, which you can see on the screen, a building that was declared national heritage in the early 2000s and was, and still is in theory, a protected modernist site. Super Servicio Lomas was designed by Vladimir Caspe in 1948 and was one of the very first multi-use buildings in Mexico City. At the time of its construction, the building was radically different from the low-rise residential context in which it was built. Employing a rationalist structure complete with piloti, a free plan, roof terrace, and classic horizontal strip windows. It became well known, however, for the unprecedented mix of programs that it brought together. A gas station, auto repair shop, car dealership, retail space, offices, executive apartments, dance hall, and party venue that overlooked the nearby Bosque de Chapultepec Park. On the right is a view looking down from the roof terrace onto the ramp below, undoubtedly one of the most iconic views and images of this building. In 2007, then mayor of Mexico City, Marcelo Ebrard, who by the way is now the Minister of Foreign Relations of Mexico and aspiring candidate to the presidency, together with a series of real estate companies, began a campaign to redevelop the site of Super Servicio Lomas. The campaign was promoted as a means to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Mexican independence. The first proposal, the 300 meter tall Torre Bicentenario was designed by OMA in Rotterdam. As an abstract design, the tower has many fans, but as a concrete proposal, it proved to be very problematic. The project required the complete demolition of Super Servicio Lomas and proposed to alter the surrounding roadways, as well as illegally occupying a part of the public Chapultepec Park. The project was ultimately canceled due to harsh criticism from the public and the National Institute that had declared Super Servicio Lomas a heritage site. However, Grupo Danos, one of the real estate companies involved in the redevelopment and the owner actually of the site, um, went to court arguing they should be able to develop the property in any way they wanted, and they won. After that, a second proposal followed, which you can see on the right, uh, the Torre Virreyes designed by architect, uh, very well-known architect, Teodoro Gonzalez de Leon. This one was approved, as you can see, of course, because it was built, completed in 2015, the construction required for the demolition of a large majority of the Super Servicio Lomas. The tower is 121 meters tall and contains 20 floors of offices and 16 floors of parking, all of which are underground. The, the large majority of Super Servicio Lomas was demolished, around 95% of it, to make way for the new structure, including the iconic ramp, and only the northern tip of the building was saved and later incorporated in the ground floor design of the new tower. Ironically, this was promoted as a benevolent act of preservation by the architect, which of course is extremely ironic. Um, the section of the building that you're seeing in this image is not the actual Super Servicio Lomas, but a reconstruction of it, which has been converted into a Maison Kaiser. In a portion outside of the frame, there's also a Starbucks. So you might be asking yourselves, how was this allowed? How is it possible that a site designated national heritage was partially demolished and then adapted in such a way? The answer, sorry, the answer in part lies in how the building's deemed cultural patrimony are classified in Mexico. The, uh, there are two national institutes that deal with preservation, INA and IMBA. INA is entrusted with archeological and historical structures zones and remnants. This primarily includes pre-Hispanic sites and Spanish colonial post-conquest architecture from the 16th to 19th centuries. Structures that fall under these categories are automatically protected by law and cannot be changed. INBA, on the, other, on the other hand, is entrusted with artistic buildings and monuments, sites that are of significant value. Structures under this category which includes all architecture from the 20th century, are not automatically protected and their aesthetic value must be assigned and argued for. 
The outcome of this phenomenon is that pre-Hispanic and colonial era architecture are given preference, particularly in terms of preservation, while architecture of the 20th century is left at the mercy of private, political, and economic interests. Uh, by the way, the photo on the right uh, is what was left of Super Servicio Lomas after its uh, demolition. So again, what you saw in the previous photo was a reconstruction of the building done by Teodoro González de Lu. Here we are meeting with Dr. Ramon Vargas to discuss this dynamic. You can also see a video uh, in our installation of part of this interview. He is professor of architectural history and philosophy at UNAM and the former head of the Direction of Architecture and Conservation of Artistic Heritage, who led the fight to protect the Super Servicio Lomas. Dr. Vargas described the hearing with the public prosecutor as follows. I open quotes. When the public prosecutor called on us to defend Super Servicio Lomas, we began to discuss an area of knowledge that was foreign to the context. We went there thinking as architects, speaking about the distribution of space, about how the building is well-oriented, about its circulation, about it being multi-use, but we were speaking with a public prosecutor and few people are more disconnected from such concepts. He listened to us and commented, that's interesting. Is Super Servicio Lomas the only building in Mexico with these characteristics? To which we replied, no, there are others. And of course he responded, why do we need to preserve this building and not the others? Why do you argue that this building had, has a very important aesthetic value? What does that mean? That's when you realize that as architects, we've created our own insular narrative. In the, in the fight of this kind, such arguments do not interest anyone but us." End of quotes. So the preservation of the 20th century architecture in Mexico is not only, as you can see, a problem of law, but also, and perhaps most importantly, a problem of communication. The mid 20th century, uh, for some context here, the mid 20th century after the Second World War was a period of sustained economic growth in Mexico, pushed forward by industrialization, increased foreign influence, particularly from the United States, and the emergence of a new capitalist class. Politicians and economists pushed to transform Mexico into a developed country and to assert uh, a modern national identity. Modernism became the perfect vehicle. These aspirations were materialized at a tremendous scale in the mid 20th century through public projects. Here you can see three of many examples. On the left uh, is the campus of UNAM where we spoke with Dr. Vargas, which was planned by Enrique del Moral and Mario Pani. At the center is Tlatelolco, also designed by Mario Pani, which was a housing project with a capacity for more than 100,000 inhabitants. The complex was conceptualized and planned as an entire city neighborhood complete with diverse economic classes, commercial space, schools, and recreation areas. It should also be noted that this project resulted from one of the largest slum clearance schemes ever executed in Mexico, displacing thousands of residents of northern Mexico City. And finally, on the right, you can see a part of the 1968 Summer Olympics master plan led by then President Adolfo Lopez Mateos and architect Pedro Ramirez Vasquez this was in many ways viewed as a culmination uh, of the government's 20th century efforts. Here we see the velodrome in the foreground and the Palacio de los Deportes designed by Felix Candela in the back. This image also speaks to the city's urban and regional fabric, which was radically transformed through infrastructure projects, including freeways, expressways, overpasses, tunnels, and an underground metro system. The capital was literally built and marketed in the image of an independent, consolidated country for an international audience. Reflecting on this history and on the precarity of 20th century architecture today, our research at Departamento del Distrito was motivated by a base set of questions regarding cultural patrimony of the built environment and the future of our cities. When buildings fall, literally by planned demolition or structural failure, or ideologically, through abandonment, neglect, or social aspirations that go unfulfilled, what is at stake for our current society? What heritage is lost and for whom? When buildings fall, how might the city and collective identity be reclaimed, transformed, and reimagined? Who is to lead the charge? At its heart, the project is a survey 
catalog and now archive of at-risk buildings from this time period. Here we have the original selection of at-risk sites with which we began, which included some very well-known projects such as Felix Candela, Restaurante Los Manantiales, and Mario Pani's Tlatelolco Social Housing Complex. For CAB, we decided to expand our initial catalog and through additional research collected over 500 sites in Mexico City. And we are still constantly adding to this list. Here, the red horizontal lines show at risk buildings. We also selected six to focus on as case studies. Each speaks to a different method, question, or challenge that surrounds preservation of the mid 20th century work. We have sought to uh, interview a range of figures from historians to activists to family owners to, uh, to those that have lived and worked in the buildings of interest. We collected various types of material and content over several years of site visits. One truly incredible aspect of the project has been holding some of the conversations in the actual buildings as you can see in some of the photographs. Um, now to talk about the installation which you can also see here and visit. The installation is structured around these six case studies with material grouped and organized on a long podium sitting here at the Central Gallery of the Graham Foundation. We made a conscious effort to include any archival, ar to not include, sorry, any ar archival content. Instead, it was important to show the current state of these projects through different media, photography, text, video, and found objects. In that way, it became a project with quite blurry boundaries when it comes to authorship and also the traditional role of the architect. So this really transformed into a curatorial project where we were able to research and design and graphically communicate information, but also commission other artists to collaborate with us, include building fragments and author of author works and to present micro histories, stories and experiences of others. Specifically, we commissioned photographer Adriana Hamui for the photographs and Darina Shabanova for the illustrations of the broadsheets, which are free to take away by exhibition visitors. These publications were actually the first way we presented this research, starting in 2017. Each building and interview were presented by means of a single broadsheet. This was the first most immediate approach for dispersing its content. On one side, there is an illustration, and on the other, a short introduction text and annotated interview. Spanish is on the top half, in this case French, and English is on the bottom half. We had fairly intensive conversations with Arina about each illustration and sent her a lot of background material. The illustrations play a vital role in how the public comes in contact with this project. It is important to us that they are playful, light, and that they have an easiness about them. The publication has been part of our concerted effort as a practice to engage with a much larger public and to reach outside of the insular world of art and architecture. So we dropped the, the broadsheets at places like the Metro, which you see in the image, uh, hung them at magazine stands, and also pasted them on the side of buildings. Here you can see another image of the plinth during the opening cab, uh, weekend of cab last year, which also shows its diagonal relationship to the gallery's walls and with some visitors interacting with it, looking at the material and taking some of the broadsheets. This is one of Adriana Jamuy's photographs looking at Luis Barragán's Casa Ortega gardens from a very busy Avenida Constituyentes. Right next to the gardens, you can see some of the type of developments that have continued uh, that have and continue uh, being built around the house, which is also right next to the very well-known Casa Barragan, as well as the Anillo Periférico in the back, a modern infrastructure project that was added a second level in the early 2000s. Here you can see the coat closet at the entrance of the house where, according to the owner, he found the original Barragan pink conserved behind the closed doors of this space and where he also keeps the paint buckets for any necessary retouching. And here you see an image of the installation with those colors painted on wood panels, the photograph itself, and some of the ruins of the Tepetate wall that divides Casa Ortega from Casa Barragan. We also made an effort to understand not only the legislative part of the issue, but also the urban condition around each site. We did this to situate each of them within a much larger discussion surrounding the contemporary growth and urban development in Mexico City. 
In this map we produced, you can see Mexico City growth from Spanish colonial rule, shown in blue, to present day uh, with expansion during the Milagro Mexicano, indicated in orange. In it, you can also see all of the catalog projects using the same color coding strategy, revealing if the time of their construction coincided with the urban development of the area where they sit. On the left here, you see uh, where real estate speculation was most intense in 2019, based on government's, government geospatial data showing these transactions in red. On the right, you see the location of all construction sites in 2019, showing an, an accumulation in areas of special risk for this type of heritage in darker blue. Here we have Torre Insignia, a tower designed by Mario Pani as part of the Tlatelolco housing complex showing the current state of its structure and of the monumental mural that covers its facade designed by artist Carlos Merida. This here is the current state of Felix Candela Restaurante Los Manantiales, which suffered considerable, considerable damage to its foundation and concrete canopy during the 2017 earthquake in Mexico City. The building is currently being renovated, but unfortunately the new plans which you can see on the rendering on the lower part of the image, and you can also see in the installation. Um, these new plans are not considering recovering its original use as restaurant and ballroom, and instead it will simply be left as an open-air structure to be visited. You can see the renderings again in the, in the installation. The exhibition included several kinds of data visualizations. We conceptualized this graphic as a zoom-in of the larger timeline. A green to red gradient is used to represent the preservation status of a select number of projects, with green representing a stable low risk condition and red representing an unstable high risk condition. What's interesting is that the life of many of these projects is volatile, falling into disrepair, changing ownership, and then being renovated several times throughout their history. Natural disasters, such as strong earthquakes, also play a role and they are represented here by the red dashed lines that cut vertically down the graphic. Finally, here you can see another image of the plinth in its location at the ground foundation, showing the relationship to the screen we installed uh, on the floor of the gallery space and where we showed some of the footage of our conversations. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Francisco. Before moving to the next uh, presentation, I would like to ask you a question. You, you stated out very clearly that the problem with the prosecutor uh, was uh, a communication problem, and you somehow came out with a communication solution by producing exhibits, by producing texts, and generally trying to generate awareness over a, a, a problem. And we could even say that making it uh, international by coming here or going elsewhere strengthens your position in terms of, yes, uh, getting this unflexible posture to somehow accept uh, another consideration over this uh, built heritage. Do you have already some results in terms of things that have been achieved uh, in regarding uh, buildings that would have turned, uh, been maltreated and finally were somehow eventually saved or destructions postponed? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it, it, it would be pretentious to say that we've saved a building because unfortunately we haven't. I mean, of course, it, that would be the ultimate dream of the project. Um, but I think for us, as you, as you mentioned, uh, co because communication, we agree with Dr. Vargas that communication is a, plays a big role. Um, that, that is precisely why we started with the broadsheets, uh, because that was even before the installation existed, it was just broadsheets, the publication. And that was uh, the reason why we wanted to make it accessible to anyone, not only people who are interested in art and architecture or know about art and arch architecture. And I would say maybe that the, uh, maybe the, the responses that I've found the most interesting um, to the project are precisely the responses of people who've read the publication and are not 
into art or in architecture or are not artists or architects. Um, you know, people like, I don't know, my mom, like a client who we had at the time and asked us about the publication. We gave her the publication and, and we actually had a very nice conversation with her about like how she basically had realized how important these buildings are. So um, we have not saved the building yet, uh, not, not that I know of, but um, we, 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 do, we do believe some people outside of the architecture world have gained consciousness about the importance of these structures. I'm sure also that you have achieved that. So uh, we will have questions. People will ask you questions. We have a big period of questions and answers after the three presentations are done. So I will go to Isabel Strauss, which is, uh, I shouldn't be saying that, but one of uh, our favorite exhibits here because we really uh, found uh, a way to inaugurate with your work uh, a new publication uh, series we're doing with uh, a collaboration with Architecture d'Aujourd'hui. And actually we made uh, yes, we published, edited an, an article you did, and we're very happy about it. So we will get the chance today to go a bit deeper into this research, which is exhibited here and on the website. And you will tell us a bit more about this very hard story of Bronzeville and how you came to work on this subject and what you discovered there. <clears throat> Hello. Okay. Thank you. Um, so happy to be with all of you here today in person. Um, thank you, Christoph, and thank you, obviously, to Fabrizio, Mark, um, and Eric, and David for giving us the invitation to the architecture biennial. So um, my name is Isabel. I'm one third of Rift Studio. Um, here today with Rekha August Nelson and Farnoosh Rafai. Um, and in preparation for this talk, I wanted to first clarify what heritage means and what heritage means to me. So by definition, heritage relates to property that descends to an heir, something transmitted or acquired from a predecessor, or something possessed as a result of one's natural situation or birth. Things also associated by definition with heritage relate to legacy, tradition, inheritance, history, family, birthright. Heritage for me also conjures certain phrases or ideas that I was introduced to growing up. The idea of passing the baton. My mother often reminds me, you come from strong stock or our ancestors had plans for us, a more recent saying. Along with these plans, often intergenerational trauma, uh, which is all related to the research I'll be presenting today, the research on display here, the project titled um, Architecture of Reparations, which is also, as Christoph mentioned, online through the paper. So this project started by moving to the neighborhood of Bronzeville, Chicago as an adult and wondering about the fabric of the neighborhood. Why were so many beautiful ornate stone row houses missing? And this project started as a graduate school thesis and through a network of designers and advisors has grown into something much more public and shared and meaningful. At the crux of the thesis is the belief that architecture can respond to things that are not architectural problems, but that have spatial manifestations. And in this case, we are proposing reparations in the form of housing. And I'd like to make a case for that by sharing a story of place. So on the south side of Chicago, nestled between the Dan Ryan Expressway on the west, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive on the east, Bronzeville stretches from 31st Street on its northern boundary to 39th Street on its southern boundary. It is home to parts of the Third Ward, the neighborhood of Douglas, the Black Belt, and the Black Metropolis, which is just to say the boundaries are amorphous 
They have changed and continue to change depending on who you talk to and when you talk to them. The stories that hover around the streets of Bronzeville are unbelievable stories. The Chicago Defenders headquarters was originally established in Bronzeville. Adler and Sullivan designed a synagogue in Bronzeville that would later be converted into the Pilgrim Baptist Church. Mahalia Jackson would usher gospel into the world in this church. This church would burn to the ground in 2006 because of a maintenance fire. And the shell of the building still stands in the neighborhood today. Martin Luther King Jr. would speak in Bronzeville at the Liberty Baptist Church during the 1960s. And approximately two blocks down and six blocks west of the only existing group of townhouses designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, another historical landmark reminds passerby that the neighborhood is one both tethered to, but also separated from the Illinois Institute of Technology. Mies van der Rohe's SR Crown Hall, a feature of 20th century modernism, commands the corner of State and 34th Street. Tucked behind a layer of trees, the building is elegant, enticing, and beautiful. What one might forget when taking in the site that is Crown Hall is that directly below the foundations of Mises' masterpiece are the remnants of another culturally rich and iconic building. The Mecca Flats, designed for white residents in anticipation of the 1893 World's Fair, but destined to be an icon for black Chicagoans, a building that's fate would be sealed with the influx of Southern African Americans into Chicago during the Great Migration, and with restrictive covenants that confined black Chicagoans to areas overlapping Bronzeville in the 20th century. As the Great Migration ushered more people into the city, it also instigated a stream of physical, psychological, economic, and legal violence against African Americans in and, Chicago, in and around Chicago's Black Belt. This violence has changed, and but it has persisted. African Americans simply did not have homes to move into. In his piece, The Case Reparations, ta Coates explains that by the 1940s, Chicago led the nation in the use of these restrictive covenants, and about half of all residential neighborhoods in the city were essentially off limits to blacks. This led to both further overcrowding within black circles and further exploitation of black families through blockbusting and through restrictive covenants. And as the black metropolis was becoming denser with African Americans fleeing the South and white Chicagoans preventing them from securing homes, IIT was hoping to expand its campus. As the story of IIT's campus expansion is rewritten year after year, levels of accountability attributed to the institution and to the city of Chicago continue to diminish. Here we see Mises' scheme for campus expansion, which wipes out a substantial part of the neighborhood via photo montage. But, um, excuse me, the context of the story tends to be consistent. And this campus expansion could not be possible without the urban renewal that utilized legislative tools for land assembly at the city, state, and federal level. These tools, outlined by the Southside Planning Board, and those organizations are listed on the left, facilitated land condemnation and campus expansion, and the displacement of over 26,000 families, most of them African American. 10,000 of these families, the SSPB admits in their report, would most likely not be able to find another home. Which is to say, the land grabbing initiated by the SSPB rippled throughout the neighborhood, and the sinister in nature and intentionality behind these real estate ventures is encapsulated within the foundations of SR Crown Hall itself. This is the Mecca building coming down. And these are the Mecca tenants that fought for the building as IIT acquired it for campus expansion. Upon acquiring the building, the school stopped providing basic maintenance for tenants and even refused to install sprinklers because of their attention to eventually demolish the structure. So this history illustrates the weight behind the, back, the fact that the Mecca building is the exact site of SR Crown Hall today. And passing through Bronzeville in 2022, one can feel the ramifications of this history spatially. 
a neighborhood once packed with row houses, is now merely peppered with them. As so many lots sit vacant, each gap like a missing tooth. And now I'm going to show a series of black and white images, all photographed by Richard Nichol. All of these houses were designed by Adler and Sullivan and all fell into disrepair because of overcrowding that was instigated by this legislative and financial violence against African Americans. So all of the following houses have been demolished. Not this one, the next one. All of these. So where do we go from here? What comes after Mecca? The request for proposal written as the first phase of this project tells the story of erasure in Bronzeville, proposes an economic model for repair, and asks how we can contribute as designers and as people telling the truth. The RFP does not attempt to find a solution to the question of what form should reparations take instead is meant to add to the list of what form reparations could take for some in the hope that one day the country will be ready to talk, to talk and that H.R. 40 will be passed. For the 2021 Chicago Architecture Biennial, this history, told through images and passages, was exhibited at the Graham Foundation. And Riff Studio invited designers, artists, planners, and one physicist to respond to the request for proposal and share their ideas about the spatial and restorative potential of reparations in the built environment. And these are the proposals that make up the large print book that we have on exhibit here today. And everyone responded to this question of what form should reparations take in their own way. For example, Darian Carr, who wrote this piece about DJ Vashad, traditional means of architectural representation, created and shared with us what he describes as a superimposition. In his essay, Darian explains that by sharing the music he's constructed from DJ Rashad's, quote, it is my hope that in this act, you'll hear something new or different something that triggers a feeling or memory of flight in order to help with the impossible task at hand, imagine, imagining an architecture that's truly black, which feels dramatic, but it's not really because impossible is every day. That's just how we live, end quote. Gabriel Ramos shares his vision for a single family commercial, a housing concept that as he says, quote, represents an investment in black creatives and support for our business endeavors. While Jalene McPherson images, quote, a rebirthing of the first black freedom town in the United States, Pocahontas Island in Petersburg, Virginia, as a liberations ground and resting grove. Sean Canty designed an annex space for the community organization Bright Star. While Whitney Hansley, Shenley, and Marcus Mello intervene on two sites, the second site in which they add a four-story multifamily apartment building that includes academic programming and symbolically references and replaces the Mecca Flats to provide living spaces for Bronzeville residents. Reka August Nelson's house number five, quote, a series, a typical set of triple-deckers aesthetically linked but ultimately siloed. These apartments offer a welcome assurance in their camaraderie, a conspiratorial comfort in their secret spatial exchange. They are not readily mappable, nor furthermore, may the whole be inferred from any part. Or Franu Shrafai's Sullivan Slip, where she explains, quote, the Sullivan Slip explores the nature of collective living for multi-generational households while peaking beyond standard thresholds of vernacular row houses. Nyla Opianga describes the confronting nature of the prompt as she was a student at IIT herself. 
Adam Mazzaro describes his artist triple-decker. This three-story apartment is composed of reclaimed Bronzeville brick hung in steel frames. Residents are empowered to live, make, and sell art in connected spaces. Zaina Mengesha designs a school. And this is DJ Iwe who composed music for our show by mixing popular beats with familiar black voices, including Nina Simone, KJ Brooks, and Gwendolyn Brooks. And on a personal level, my own response to the RFP also took the form of a series of intimate mixes or mashups. Using visual imagery created by artists that got me through the period of periods like the spring of 2020. These collages helped me to identify the spirit behind my own proposal that of a family village or a family that extends beyond the nuclear family where relatives live communally either near one another or in the same household. And through this project, merely by telling the story of erasure and exhibiting this varied collection of responses to a shared history, in parallel to organizations like the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America and artists like Tanika Lewis Johnson, who spoke yesterday. And this is Tanika's work alongside ours um, at Expo Chicago. We were able to get the attention of at least one of the organizations from the Southside Planning Board, though we're not allowed to say yet which one. Um, and share this history with them so that they might confront their own heritage and the heritage we have in common. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. This is really extremely dense and extremely rich. And I think that uh, looking at this work is for us somehow like um, looking at the series where you get the third and the fourth season and we miss the first and the second one. And what we miss to understand what, because you're talking about reparations, you're talking about what happened in the second half of the 20th century, what we're missing is actually how uh, the American city uh, ended up being so segregated. And perhaps the information we could add to make this a bit clearer is that Actually, the American city was built in a very segregated way with flats, uh, with racial identity, with areas with racial identity. And it was finally, we, we don't like to say that because we're, uh, America is our friend, but it was closer to South Africa uh, in the apartheid in some period than to European mixed cities. So this is perhaps the... The, the part we're missing to understand how it becomes such a violent situation for people, even if it has to do with them moving to a better world or a better condition, finding new work, getting to work in a new city, in a new system. But finally, yes, there are things that are left. So it's, yes, one has to, to go, I think, deeper in this and your work and Tonika's work are really asking for more history. I mean, for people to go and look up the elements about how this came out to be configured the way it is. I'm sure there are a lot of questions in the public, so I will pass the, the parole to uh, David because he has also a few things to tell us and then we will be able to discuss. I think it works, you okay. just need to go. All right. And so I'm gonna talk very briefly, um, and in a lot of ways I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, some prior work that I did in North Lawndale, uh, which is one of the neighborhoods in which the biennial sites were taking place. Uh, and uh, before I start, I do want to thank ARC Unrev as well. Uh, I think it's been a great opportunity um, 
to be able to um, re, uh, represent the exhibition in uh, more than one space, especially in this past year in which uh, fewer people were able to travel to the biennial itself. And so I think opening it up to a wider audience. So thank you for that. Um, but I am going to talk not so much about the biennial, but one neighborhood in particular, which is outlined in blue, uh, North Lawndale. Um, in a way, my research in Chicago, when I moved, the, I moved to Chicago in 2004. Um, in 2005, I was asked to uh, work with the Chicago Architecture Foundation on an exhibit in North Lawndale. Uh, that was actually um, at the kind of request and initiative of Charles Leakes, the Director of Neighborhood Housing Services, North Lawndale. So, um, who wasn't an initial resident of North Lawndale, but in becoming the director, they are moved to the neighborhood and really look to uh, learn about the neighborhood and think about how do you really begin to promote uh, neighborhood housing services, initiatives and services um, in terms of housing and home ownership uh, in the context of North Lawndale. So realizing that um, one, really looking at the neighborhood and saying, well, um, recognizing that there was a significant history there. And so in some ways, um, I uh, was given the charge of helping to flesh out those ideas and working closely with Charles Leakes as well as others uh, to begin to put together this exhibit. Um, so uh, here you can just see it, North Lawndale in a little bit greater detail. Um, and when I say this, I'm going to go through this um, exhibition very briefly in terms of just some of its themes and I think touching on some of the questions that have just been raised. Um, and then I think, too, uh, also talking very briefly about some work that I did in Houston, Texas that uh, was a couple of years prior. Uh, so in some ways, looking at um, some similar neighborhoods in um, a different city context. And so a little bit there, types of similarities in terms of what's taking place as well. Um, so North Lawndale is a West Side um, community. Uh, it is uh, uh, principally African American community in its history. It has, um, it was really started as a um, Czech immigrant community. Uh, it then very, and this was pretty much at the turn of the uh, 20th century. Uh, it then, in a short period of time after that, became a Jewish community. Uh, and then, um, and that was probably from about the t uh, 19 teens to tw uh, through uh, 20s up through the uh, 50s. And in the, in the 50s, it became a black, uh, black neighborhood principally through uh, continuation of the Great Migration North, as well as some migration from uh, the South Side into the West Side. Um, and so those really have been the three uh, populations that have uh, lived uh, the primary occupants of that neighborhood. Um, and at the same time, it has a very rich history in terms of in industrial development, entertainment development, um, and that's what I will be talking about a little bit. So we, um, the working title was actually proposed by, or the title was proposed by Charles, but with knowledge of learning from Las Vegas as an architecture text, so uh, learning from North Lawndale. So really looking to ask what could we learn from its past, pre or in terms of thinking about its past, present, and its future. Um, and so really making the argument that uh, when you really begin to look at the history, you should, you would begin to say this is a neighborhood that we should know more about, uh, much more than we do. Um, and so really asking the question about why, starting to raise questions about why that might not be the case. And so really trying to look both across primarily the uh, Jewish history and black history to begin to talk about the neighborhood. Um, and so I'm just, this is a catalog that is available online through a search. Uh, if you just look for learning from North Lawndale, you would be able to read about each one of these themes. So we really begin to quickly think about this as looking at, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to say eight themes and maybe 10. Uh, but um, in a way, trying to look both at the social history in relationship to um, the building history and infrastructure history. 
um, and how those two begin to tell a kind of story of the neighborhood and then also looking at the context of the neighborhood now. So uh, in terms of movements, uh, really looking at uh, or trying to, and when I say this, I think uh, this was an exhibit that was put together in a year's time uh, and with a very small team. And so if anything, it was starting to raise, uh, introduce just uh, kind of introductory research rather than I would say more in-depth research. Uh, so um, really looking at Jewish intellectual history that started to develop along um, within the neighborhood, principally along uh, Douglas Boulevard and uh, Independence Boulevard, where there are a number of, uh, uh, there's a Jewish center as well as a number of synagogues. Um, Golda Meir briefly lived here for, I think, a summer. And so also trying to really look at and think about what was the um, intellectual history that was taking place um, at the time. Additionally, um, Martin Luther King lived in the neighborhood um, during the 60s when he was looking to do a set of uh, marches into Cicero, which is the West Side community just outside of uh, Chicago, where, uh, so adjacent to North Lawndale. And so really lived in this neighborhood for a period of time um, as a resident um, while um, organizing those sets of protests. Uh, it's also, and I need to, uh, from an industry standpoint, its most significant uh, history is it is the he uh, headquarters and really the start where uh, Sears and Roebuck started. So uh, both its factory, warehouse, administration building uh, were all located here. Uh, there is an elevated train line that moves east and west that was specifically built for, um, for uh, that factory and its mail order catalog and the ability to produce goods there and then ship them both east and west. Uh, so in a way, the major, um, what was uh, really the first major um, large, I won't say department store, catalog store, um, uh, was located here in North Lawndale. And so really became, became the kind of um, uh, lifeblood of the community, um, along with uh, subsequently other industry uh, that moved in right along the border of Cicero and, um, and North Lawndale. Um, Again, along the boulevard, one finds a number of synagogues, um, including Stone Temple Baptist, now, and which are now churches, including Stone Temple Baptist Church, uh, which is, I would say, one of the more significant sites, uh, not only for the architecture, but this is the site where Martin Luther King gave several speeches in North Lawndale. Uh, and then, um, so you can still, on that boulevard, see a presence of those buildings. Um, they are can today churches rather than synagogues. Uh, a lot of them are in disrepair, but still active um, sites. Uh, there's also the Central Park Theater, uh, which you see the interior in the image here in terms of an entertainment. So that was the, one of the first uh, movie palaces in the city and really where um, uh, uh, Balaban and Katz uh, began to form the idea of a, a movie palace before subsequently building a series of other uh, movie, house, movie palaces that still stand within the city today. That is one of the biennial sites in terms of there is a group that's actively looking to, um, to renovate it. Uh, it is a church now as well. Um, and so trying to look at both that kind of entertainment history. So this is also where Benny Goodman grew up uh, and uh, gave his first performance. Uh, it's also has a blues history. Um, and so really trying to look at uh, across both, um, both time periods, how it had a kind of significance to um, really kind of US history and subsequently musics that are known around the world. Um, and then really what uh, was the initial impetus for the exhibit was Charles in walking through the neighborhood really started to think about the presence of graystones. So really uh, uh, two and three flat housing typology uh, on Chicago's 25 by 125 foot sites. Sorry, I don't know the metric conversion. Uh, but it is taped out here in the... Uh, in the um, 
gallery, so you're able to, or in the hall, so you're able to get a feel for what that means dimensionally. Uh, but really uh, projecting that he thought North Lawndale might have the highest quantity of um, gray stones within the city. And um, prior to uh, his moving there, I think uh, Chicago had introduced um, an awareness of the bungalow and the bungalow belt that surrounds, uh, that is within and surrounding the city. And so he thought that through the architecture, he could really begin of um, the Greystone and really promoting the idea of the Greystone as a significant high, uh, housing typology in the city and uh, North Lawndale having an abundance of them. Uh, that one could really begin to understand um, these or present a kind of architectural ex uh, significance of North Lawndale relative to housing as well. So that was his initial impetus. And then also within this exhibit, we were looking to build, uh, build a history in terms of really talking about the neighborhood further. Uh, at the same time, actively from the 18, uh, 1980s uh, through the present, uh, building uh, gray stones as well as um, some synagogues and temples uh, were uh, consistently being torn down. Um, I would say uh, they are just as much a kind of the uh, uh, the uh, vacant now vacant lots are just as much a defining characteristic of the neighborhood as the buildings. Uh, and I will add very quickly that uh, as vacant lots, I think uh, across both west and south sides. Um, one aspect to remember is in a way through the city's demolition process, they actually have set up a kind of challenge uh, for anyone that's looking to utilize those lots. And so a challenge for the neighborhoods, uh, which is really that the demolition has always been to really tear down the building and then push all the rubble into the foundation. Um, and so it presents a uh, a um, issue where all of the sites are brown, designated browns, uh, brown fields in terms of not really knowing what the pollutants are in terms of lead paint, as well as not really knowing uh, the condition of what's in the foundation. Some have indications of leaky basements and so uh, in a way obstacles towards really uh, uh, anyone outside of a large developer being able to um, recuperate the site and build on it. Um, and then here, I'll go through these just, but also then looking at uh, what's the relationship to parks and boulevards as well as gardens. Uh, it having one of the larger, one of the three large west side parks. Uh, and then also what are some of its other um, institutions that were taking place both um, uh, during its during the kind of Jewish history, but then also uh, this cultural center that you see on the on the right is um, really uh, one of the first buildings that was built um, in the early 2000s. Uh, it's on the site of Sears, and so Sears really, once they had demoed the factory, um, they subsequently built some housing um, in an area called Home and Square and then built this cultural center uh, as well. Um, what remains is the tower of uh, the administration building. Uh, there's a school that's in the powerhouse. And so there are a few remnants that are um, in continued use. Um, and then finally, I would say really also just looking to talk about um, the, that it is a, a neighborhood that is still very well served by um, different transportation in, infrastructure. Uh, both two train lines run at the north and south edges. Uh, uh, Ogden Avenue runs through, that's the start of Route 66, uh, famous in song. Um, and so really, uh, even from a, just a kind of basic infrastructural perspective, it's well conditioned um, in terms of uh, having the ability to be a much more vital neighborhood um, in terms of um, residents. It is a neighborhood that has continued to see population decline, uh, but it is a uh, residence that I think in some ways too, part of the story that we were looking to tell, uh, has continued to see a lot of uh, residents engaged and invested in the neighborhood. Uh, I think through that kind of history with Martin Luther King as well as Golda Meir, and I want to particularly mention um, 
in the lower right, um, the Earls, uh, who are really some of the early uh, community or um, community garden gardeners uh, in Chicago. I think they are throughout the city. They are believed to be the first have started the first community garden, Slumbusters Garden. So they are also early um, documenters of some of the conditions that were taking place in terms of demolition. Uh, and then just very quickly too, I wanted to switch to Houston um, and uh, talk about Project Row Houses as a somewhat of a kind of inspiration and informant of my work. While I was teaching at Rice, uh, Project Row Houses had started. Um, subsequently in 2001, uh, another architect, William Williams, and I both teaching at Rice were able to organize, uh, curate a round of installations within those houses. Uh, but I think what's always been interesting to me about those houses is the, the thought that Rick Lowe and his collaborators brought to them that uh, out of, I think, about 16 houses, eight are used for installations uh, by artists. Uh, I think six are used for um, young single mothers. And then there's also uh, in the remaining houses a children's youth program. And to me, that all ties to uh, uh, Rick Lowe was a student of John Biggers, and John Biggers really looked to communicate the importance of the shotgun house generationally within Third Ward. Um, and so uh, to me, I think also just in terms of heritage that uh, the building awareness that uh, Rick Lowe and others have brought to the Rowe House is fostered by uh, an understanding of it as presented through the paintings of John Biggers. And then very quickly, um, in both Third Ward, where Project Row Houses in, is located in Freedmanstown, um, which is Second Ward, right directly adjacent to downtown, uh, those are two uh, historically black neighborhoods where I first really began to look at some issues of um, of vacancy, working with um, both, uh, in the case of Freedmanstown, a small uh, group that was interested in starting a land trust, and when I say that, a group of three individuals. Um, and so how could they, with a very small amount of resources, grow a land trust was kind of the, the thinking. And then in Third Ward, uh, really looking at how tax delinquency was becoming an ongoing issue where the city was thinking about reclaiming property uh, that had, where tax delinquency was exceeded by 50%. So those led to some studios. These are just looking at those in brief. I'm not gonna go through these, but this is where this kind of thinking of what's the possibility of vacant land uh, first started and really starting to look at vacant land, not individually, but as a collection. And I think to me, that's also brought uh, within my thinking in Chicago, uh, how to really begin to think about um, all of the neighborhoods with vacant land and what are both the, the kind of similarities in terms of their histories. Uh, they are principally black and brown neighborhoods um, and have gone through similar stories, but also understanding that each one is different. And so really in working with the community organizations, starting to understand and help foreground both uh, what are those differences as well as talk about their commonalities. Very quickly, Blanche Suggs, who is one of the Central Park Theater Group uh, team and is also in the video, uh, also directs Lawndale Heritage, uh, which inherited the exhibit. And they are going through uh, each panel and really trying to research in great, much greater depth uh, what was initially done for the exhibit back in 2003. So in some ways, uh, they view that exhibit as a guide in which they can begin to thus recover a lot more of their history and communicate a lot more of their history. Thank you. Thank you. This is again very rich and we need more time to digest it, but just to give us, give us a few keys to understand and to compare situations, to understand how this, yes, how the Chicago can work the way it works, to compare it with European cities where a lot of things are mutualized between richer neighborhoods and poorer neighborhoods because, of course, even in Bordeaux, which is a model city in France, you get 
some sort of segregation. And you have other cities that have much more segregation problems like the northern part of Paris, Marseille, and their segregation is really a problem. But at least you have this idea that some things are put in common and a lot of things works on a metropolitan level, schools, infrastructures, and all of this. How does it work in Chicago? I mean, I get the sense that each community, each neighborhood has to deal with its own problems and can only depend on itself. Uh, I guess it's, um, in some ways, I think you'd have to look across the, uh, across the history of the city, and I welcome Isabel's input on this too. Uh, I think there's, um, there have been um, there have been efforts that um, you get changing terms that begin to take place over time. So when I say that, um, I think uh, no one when the city was being created prior to the Great Migration, nobody anticipated the Great Migration, uh, and you have um, you have a series of reactions continuously. Uh, that begin to to um, begin to undercut those neighborhoods even before I think they knew that they were being undercut. Um, and when I say that, I think just the issues of so um, I think in North Lawndale, one of the things we also begin to look at is, um, which is a little bit different than what Tanika presented yesterday. There was something called contract buying. Um, so the only way that somebody could become a homeowner. Uh, in North Lawndale was to buy directly from a resident through uh, what's called a contract. Um, so not like, unlike a mortgage, you, d you do not gain any equity until you've fully paid for, um, for the home. And so you're always susceptible month by month to uh, being uh, thrown out of the home. Um, and that was the only way in which... Um, uh, black residents could acquire homes, and at the same time, those neighborhoods were get, starting to get uh, redlined in terms of continued um, residency by um, uh, whites within the city. So, um, and then you also have the interstate systems coming in, and it, now everyone is understanding that those systematically are, um, were principally through uh, black neighborhoods. And then there are, and I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I realize this now, like uh, as it cuts through those communities, there's also just the issues of where are exits and um, entries and exits, which then also begins to talk about what's the degree to which businesses could be supported. Um, the schools, I think it's more, um, it is issues of, um, on the one hand, probably initially overcrowding, so not enough schools. As um, at the height of, uh, say, uh, black population within the South Side and West Side, uh, I think over time it's been as uh, there's less and less population. Uh, this idea of uh, or needing to to or proposing to close schools um, that you no longer have, say, the the resident population to sustain a school. Um, but that those things begin to go hand in hand, um, coupled with, um, I think, um, public housing is something that um, was m much more vital within the U.S. Uh, for the total population of cities early on, um, and that slowly began to... Um, become the idea that public housing is really more um, effectively low-income housing. Um, and it's, I think you just have to look at those total histories. Um, and it's, I think it's also just the kind of, um, and it's, when I say that, I think that is all born out of really um, post-war, post-World War II in the U.S., uh, and the emphasis on home ownership um, that started to really uh, become the basis for a lot of the development of the suburbs are, are things that also uh, subsequently undermine the cities. And that includes um, really uh, black neighborhoods uh, where in some ways I would say the, uh, a kind of un, un, 
unformed I, idea, and it also occurs as uh, industry is already in de decline in some ways in the 60s and more readily clear in the 70s. Uh, but in a way, um, uh, the great migration is taking place or it's continuing into a time in which I would say um, the way in which Chicago had worked was already starting to fail and uh, nobody saw it. So when I say that a Czech community comes in, everyone builds that neighborhood, uh, they are prosperous and they were able to move out of it. Uh, a Jewish community comes in, they are prosperous and able to move out of it. Black community comes in and really uh, the same resources were there, but at the same time already starting to decline, uh, coupled with other pressures that were being introduced, I think, through redlining and ideas about home ownership. And so they are unable to, uh, to see the same benefit or the same kind of promise. Um, but in also just quickly going to your question, a lot of neighborhoods in um, Chicago are still actively entry points for immigrants. Um, and some of those, like Ukrainian village, although less so, still has a continued Ukrainian population coming in. Um, and that is a kind of entry point into the city. Um, and so there are still the, those active kind of um, immigrant neighborhoods that occur. I don't know if you want to. I think you said it perfectly. I completely agree. Thank you. Well, I think the, it's time for questions. And you will be able to pose des questions, and you can also pose them in French, and then we will translate. So, you don't hesitate to take the parole in the two languages, in French or in English, to pose des questions. Oui. No, no, you cannot, you cannot get it there. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. The thing that should be with me is like trailing. <laughs> Oui, bonjour, je m'appelle Mar Marguerite et je vous remercie beaucoup pour votre intervention qui est, qui est très, très enrichissante et je pense qu'au jour d'aujourd'hui dans le monde entier, on essaye justement de, de ce qu'on appelle faire de la frugalité en fait architecturale. Moi, ma question serait, euh, au jour d'aujourd'hui, euh, vu l'évolution que tous ces chantiers ont pris, comment les gens interprètent euh, le projet que vous avez eu dès le départ Et je poserai la question aux différents intervenants. Voilà. Si j'ai eu une réponse de chacun, ce serait bien, pour voir un peu l'évolution euh, des différents projets. So for each one of you, how your project is being perceived and what were the reactions you received over your work I'll, I'll start since I have the microphone, uh, and I will, will also not try to listen to myself in French. <laughs> uh, uh, so the biennial, I think, has really, I would say, jump-started something I've been trying to do. So um, I started to try to work with two organizations in North Lawndale. Um, Right after 2015 exhibiting the work, I decided that the next step was to really work with organizations um, and try to realize some spaces. I uh, subsequently presented the work in North Lawndale. Two organizations expressed interest. Uh, one of those is uh, the, uh, shoot, I'm not going to think of the name of it right now, is uh, really the park site that has the kind of weird totem pole, I call them totem poles. Uh, the name will come to me in a moment. But a school, a charter school in North Lawndale uh, has been a continued partner since 2015. Uh, we were applying for grants together uh, and seeing interest from potential grantors to support the work. Um, and they would always ask for more information, and then we'd get to the point of somehow they would want to see an example. So they were clearly interested, but at the same time couldn't quite envision what we had in mind. I think through the work um, of the biennial, and now we actually have, uh, there were 15 spaces built, 10 remain. Uh, 
And so we are able to point to examples of, um, of what is intended. And so I think both from the standpoint of potential uh, grantors, uh, uh, it's, there should be greater success in being able to continue to lo the work. I think it's also informative for other organizations in terms of starting to think about what's possible. And then I think what's been rewarding for me uh, is how a number of organizations that really did participate in the biennial have subsequently been able to jumpstart their projects further. Uh, so Isabel was telling me that uh, I think uh, Grow Greater Inglewood, which uh, has ambitions of doing an Inglewood Trail, um, was a biennial participant, and they subsequently, I think, have raised the money to uh, be able to fully proceed with the trail. And so I think um, it's that aspect of how the, the work has already foregrounded some of those organizations um, and that they've been able to um, accelerate some of what they've been trying to do is... Um, to me, an indicator of how the work is being received as well. In in our in our case, I would say, I mean, the the project started, as you know now, as as a publication. Um, so after that, when we were invited by by David to participate, I, I, I the the project really grew immensely like right now like what you're actually able to see here is a part of basically the archive that we have now um, uh, in the catalog so the idea of the project now is to because of the platform that, in which we participated at, at the uh, Chicago Architecture Biennial uh, and of course now here at Arc and Rev uh, the idea is to bring it to Mexico because this this material has actually not been ex sorry, exhibited in Mexico uh, I would say for various reasons, but now there is interest. Um, now that it's been abroad, there is interest for it to be shown there, uh, which of course we think is 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 important uh, to start the conversation there, which is really a conversation that is not really being uh, had uh, in Mexico. So the idea is to do that. We also um, are starting to work on a, a potential publication, like. Because again, the material that you're seeing here is is just a part of it. So, um, having a publication where we can talk about the issue at large, and I would say that uh, also at the office, uh, this research has helped us um, kind of address projects in a different way. We also do architectural projects, so we have the research, uh, but we also design uh, structures. So, um, also what we've learned from the project has helped us. Uh, inform some of the uh, ways in which we design architecture as well. So uh, I would say this, it's, it's twofold the um, impact that the project has had. Um, our project has been received well by other people doing advocacy work and for activists it's still very tame. Um, and then our country is so divided for some, when you say the word reparations, they shut down. So it's a mixed reception. Some people have not, have chosen not to engage with it. We do have a charity who is interested in using the research, which, um, is a dream. And our goal is to really hand off the project to an organization that has greater means than the three of us do because the problem is so important. Um, and then with a secure handoff to pursue design, to keep pursuing the design aspects. So we're working on entrusting it in the right hands. Um, yeah. Before having more questions, I would like to say one thing that came out to me why I think it's very important of doing the work you did on Bronzeville because we see that for example in the global modernity architectural history you have some paradigms like Prit Ego for example that go into history as an example that somehow justifies segregation I mean what happened there is considered and is taught as an example of how 
uh, a poor community fails and in less than 15 years they have to keep it. And going, telling another story of this, because it, it could be the same story, it could be like a pretty good segregation story, but telling it from the other side is very important. And I think that it's, it's a reverse movement and it allows finally to understand and to tell the story differently. So that's, that's one reason why I think it's very important. Uh, I have a question for you, Isabel. Like, um, I, I would, sometimes I visited the Illinois Institute of Technology. I think that in the end, everyone knows about the story there. So it's really the elephant in the room that everyone knows about it, but no one really talks about it. Um, what I do not know is, is the Illinois Institute of Technology or has the Illinois Institute of Technology acknowledge what happened? Uh, are there measures that have been taken? Are there actions that, of course, it's too late to, to completely revert the process that occurred, but is it something that, uh, that in, in your opinion, and you, you will decide how much diplomatic you want to answer, but is it something that the, the IIT has, has somehow taken in account into future policies, into, into actions? Because they, are, they were the tool of segregation in a way. They, they, they benefited from what, what, what occurred. And is it something you think of any concern for the governance or for the, for the way the university is run now? They have not spoken to us about it. Um, as you said, it is known at the school. I spent a lot of time in the archives at IIT and the librarian at the time, Mindy, spoke to me about how, again, you're, you're not allowed to discuss it. Um, so, you know, it's understood that it will not be brought up. I think that the school will be compelled to acknowledge the history, especially as more institutions are setting an example. Um, you know, Evanston, Illinois has a restorative housing program uh, that they started, I believe, in 2020. Um, and Asheville, North Carolina has reparations program, Santa Monica, Harvard um, University has committed $100 million to investigating their relationship to the legacy of slavery. So as it is normalized, I hope, it is my hope that people will say, why haven't you done anything yet? When perhaps three years ago, it would have been it would have been easily brushed off, would have been easily brushed off as something impossible to address. Are there more questions? D'autres questions? So, I will thank you for your coming here and sharing all this with us. Merci d'avoir de nous avoir suivi. Je vous invite donc à visiter le dernier jour de l'exposition commun et à venir tout à l'heure aussi écouter la dernière conférence du dernier jour de l'exposition commun. Voilà. Merci beaucoup et